battery chain. We're good to go. We're going to finish up Acts chapter 12 this morning. And uh, I've got the questions for Acts chapter 13 out there that we'll most likely get started on Wednesday night. We were talking about Peter's release from prison and going to Mary's house, the, the mother of John Mark. We're going to talk more about John Mark in the sermon this morning have a bit of a character study on him. He doesn't get talked about all that much, but uh, he's a pretty prominent figure in the New Testament. Probably more so than most people realize. <clears throat> so after we have a word of prayer, we'll pick back up with uh, verse 11. Our Holy Father, we're thankful for this day that Thou hast blessed us with. We're thankful for Thy watchful care over us and the abundance of blessings we have in Thy hands every day. We're thankful, Father, for this time we have to be together in the study of Thy Word. And we pray that as we study together, we might be drawn closer together to one another and in our service to Thee. We pray, Father, that Thou would be with those of our number that have a special need of Thy loving care at this time. They're struggling with their health. They're going through trials. We pray that Thou would be with each one of them. And Help them to overcome those things and have comfort and peace as only Thou can give. We pray, Father, that Thou would forgive us when we fall short of Thy glory. We know that we stumble and we make mistakes. and We pray that we would always be quick to repent and quick to turn back to Thee and to seek Thy forgiveness, knowing that Thou art faithful to forgive when we will come to Thee. We pray again now, Father, that Thou would bless us in this time of study as we give Thee all the thanks and all the praise in Christ's name. Amen. All right, picking back up with verse 11, Acts chapter 12, it says, And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. We talked about that Wednesday night, that expectation, how uh, eager they were, even at the very time that they were celebrating freedom from bondage, that they were eager to have Peter in bondage and to anticipate his execution. So there's, we're, and, and we're going to uh, see more emphasis on that as we go through the book of Acts, um, as we see this persecution with Herod now, and as Paul starts to travel and how the Jews chased him around and caused problems for him everywhere he went, that uh, this uh, intensifying persecution of the church going on through the remainder of the book of Acts. Verse 12, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. Uh, one of the things that is interesting about the, the uh, double names there, and we see that quite frequently, is that it was fairly common at this time, uh, during this period of Roman dominion, we might say, uh, for Jews to have essentially two names. Uh, one a Hebrew name, which would be John, and one a more Roman name, which would be Mark. Uh, Mark is a, a, a fairly common Roman name. Yeah, well, that's it, it, it's it's not talking about his last name here being Mark. It's it, it's more of a, a given name, Mark, um, whose surname was Mark. Where many were gathered together praying, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness. She did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she <clears throat> kept insisting, 
that it was so. So they said it is his angel. So let's go through the questions uh, from that passage and then we'll, we'll go on. Uh, we left off with uh, 392, so we'll pick back up with 393. What happened when Peter came to the house? Yeah, right. That's, that's right. Uh, and and knowing the kind of the layout of the houses kind of helps understand this. And it's still this way in in uh, uh, I don't I don't know if we would say Asian architecture or you know the, the the way houses are made in this part of the world. Even now, when I lived in India, the houses had like a compound wall. Uh, around the, the yard. It's not many houses just have open yards like, like here. Mo most most uh, houses have uh, like a walled in courtyard outside the house. Well, um, one of the things that we're gonna find out about Mark in, uh, as we talk about him more this morning is that he was the cousin of Barnabas. Well, what's one of the things we know about Barnabas? As far as, you know, when, when, when you're thinking about what kind of house this might have been, right? If, uh, if Mary was Barnabas's, I've, I've read some that said that, that uh, uh, this was uh, Barnabas's sister, which would make Mark his uh, nephew, but in Colossians chapter 4, it refers to him as his cousin, and the, the, the word that's translated cousin there it means the same thing we would mean if we said cousin. So I don't know why some commentators say that it, uh, that, that Mary was Barnabas's sister. It would be Barnabas's aunt, right? If if Mark was Barnabas's cousin, right? Well, that's and that's some of that. That's one of the arguments that people make with uh, uh, when it lists Jesus' brother. Right? They say, well, you know, they use the word brother for cousins and, you know, other relations. Well, there's no reason to, to understand it that way. Um, but the, the, the word, the Greek word that's translated cousin in Colossians chapter 4, like I said, you know, you look up that word, it means the same thing we mean by cousin. So that would make Mary Barnabas' aunt. Whether it was his sister, his aunt, what, what the relation was there they, that calls Mark his cousin, um, if you're thinking about the family of Barnabas, what, what, what's the impression you have of Barnabas? What, what's, the, what's Barnabas's introduction when we first read about Barnabas? He's a good man. What, what, what did he do that, that you know, he, he comes on the scene? That we, we first learned about him at the end of Acts chapter 4, right? And, and it, what's, the, what's the context? His charity, right? He sold a piece of property and took it and gave it to the apostles. And that's, you know, Ananias and Spira try to follow, you know, they, they, they it seems to be implied there that, that their hypocrisy was they wanted the same kind of recognition that Barnabas got without doing what Barnabas did. So, okay, if Barnabas is somebody that has the means to go and sell a piece of property and give it to the church, what, 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 what kind of impression does that give about Barnabas? He wasn't poor. That's what I'm getting at. He, he was benevolent, yes. He had the means to, to, to do things like that. Uh, uh, and and um, it, it gives the impression, to me anyway, I, I, it, it seems to me that uh, the impression there is that Barnabas was a person of means. He, he, he you know, uh, travels with uh, Paul on missionary journeys and um, you know, he, he had the means to do things like that. Um, so, when you're picturing Mary's house, the mother of John Mark, well, first of all, how is it described? It says, uh, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where, what? Verse 12, 
where many were gathered together praying. Okay, well, to have a place where many could be gathered together, that has to be a, you know, substantial place, doesn't it? I mean, it's... Peter knew to go there. Now, you know, did the angel tell Peter? Did the Holy Spirit tell Peter? You know, I, it doesn't say. It just says Peter went there. Peter knew to... Right. That that this is... Uh, uh, this was a place, and we talked about that Wednesday night. That Mary's house was a place that was known to be a, a place of assembly for the church. Right? The church in Jerusalem, or the brethren in Jerusalem, uh, it, it seems to be indicated there that they regularly gathered at Mary's house. Mary had a house where they could regularly gather. And uh, larger homes... Uh, even like I said, even now, when I was in India, this is you know how it still is. Uh, they they you know have well uh, the second place me and Mary lived after we got married. When we got married, I had an apartment and we you know lived there in the apartment for just a short time, and then we moved to another town, uh, and and uh, we rented a, a, a small apartment that was inside. A compound. The main house was, you know, uh, facing the road, with the 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 property walled in, and you know it was a about a you know seven foot wall. I mean, couldn't see over it. Uh, it was over my head, which I mean, I know that's not saying much, but it was over my head, and and so it was completely you know walled in, and it was a you know big area out there. You could you could have easily had a, a large assembly. You know, in that in that courtyard, in that walled-in courtyard. Uh, well, at night, the the gate gets closed, and there's in the gate there's a smaller you know like door where a person can come and go. But at night, it gets closed and locked up, and and stays that way. So when Peter comes knocking at the door, um, it, it the, the to me that that's what I picture. Is, is it's this kind of uh, uh, outside gate, and he's at that outside gate. And, and so that, that kind of helps with, you know, why she didn't just, you know, fling the door open. You know, somebody comes knocking at our door, what do we do? We open the door. <laughs> well, that's not the kind of door it was, right? It was, it was in a gate, outside gate. And so I think picturing it helps to, you know, get the scene in mind and, and what's going on. Um, so, uh, 394, how did those assembled there react to being told Peter was at the door? They didn't believe it, they didn't believe it was Peter. Right. Right. You know, what... What, what does it say that they were there doing? What, why, why were they assembled there at Mary's house? And, and you know, uh, uh, what, what was the purpose of the assembly? They were praying for Peter. And yet when she comes, and, and we talked about this in, in uh, uh, one of the sermons, uh, and, and yet when, when they come and say, hey, you know, she comes and says, hey, Peter's at the gate. And they, they dismiss it. No, that's, and that's, that was the point in the lesson is that, you know, we have a good example here uh, of how to pray because it says um, that uh, they were gathered together praying and uh before this, in verse 5, it says, But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Well, here, they're at Mary's house, and we see the scene of that constant prayer being offered for him. They were gathered together praying. And so we, we, we have the example there of how to pray. Pray constantly, right? Uh, be, be, uh, uh, be in constant prayer. But we also have the example of how not to pray, right? Yeah, 
Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's That's right. Yeah, if you're coming together to pray for rain, bring an umbrella, right? <laughs> don't 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 pray in doubt. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they were praying for Peter, but at the same time, it seems that they had some doubt over what Peter's welfare would would be, and so. Um, right. That's right. E e right, right. E e even after the women came and said, "Hey, the tomb's empty," he's, you know, and an angel told us, "Why do you seek the living among the dead?" And uh, uh, they, they still doubted, right? In, until they saw Jesus in person. Wh why do? What do we call the apostle Thomas? Doubting, Doubting Thomas. Uh, why? <laughs> Because he said, I won't believe until I see the print of the nails in his hand and put my hand in the, in the, the uh, 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 spear wound in his side, right? I, I'm not going to believe it until I see it for myself, right? Well, in, in, in one sense, that's a good trait because we, we shouldn't be gullible, right? But in another sense, Jesus had been telling them that that was what was going to happen. And so... Instead of saying, I'm not going to believe it until I see it for myself, why not say, uh, well, that's what he said was going to happen. I, I, want, to, I want to look into it more and, and you know, uh, verify it and make sure that what we're hearing is, is true, right? Um, so, yeah, it is similar to, to the reaction to the resurrection here. That's right. Um, so 394, or 395, to whom did Peter send the report of what had happened? To James and the brethren. Uh, now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. Now, we know for a fact that that is not who. <laughs> How does this chapter begin? James. The, 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 the apostle. So this, this isn't the apostle James, right? Because this chapter starts out with, with James being put to death. This is James, the brother of the Lord, the writer of the letter of James, right? And, and from, from here on, you, you, you see uh, James, the brother of the Lord, um, in a prominent role in the Jerusalem church. Um, he's, he's not referred to as one of the elders. He might have been. But he's not referred to as one of the elders. It's usually James and the elders, right? And, well, and here it's uh, James and the brethren, right? So, you know, some have speculated that, that James was the uh, uh, evangelist uh, of the Jerusalem church. Um, some have speculated that he, he was one of the elders and, you know, the more prominent of the elders. Um, but it, it, it doesn't say that. Uh, the, the role that James played in the Jerusalem church was a prominent role, which kind of it makes me think that, that he was the, the preacher, essentially, the, the, the public speaker. Look over at uh, Revelation chapter 1. Because in, in uh, addressing the seven churches of Asia, um, it, it says who 
the uh, message was to be sent to, right? Uh, let's see, verse 12, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw... Uh, let me back up. In verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So is it is it just chapters one and two that are the that that's what was supposed to be sent to those seven churches, right? We got the the letter what what we refer to as the letters to the seven churches. Is it is it just those? No, it's the book of Revelation, right? That's going to be sent. There's these seven addresses specifically to those churches, but it says that you know what you see, you write it down and send it to them. Uh, and of course, seven, the, the significance of the number seven and seven congregations being chosen out, um, there's, there's a lot of significance to that. Seven is a number um, of universality, we might say. So it's the, the church universal. The problems that are addressed in the seven addresses to the churches are universal things, you know, that, that uh, we encounter in the church and so but aside from that it goes on and says then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the seven lampstands one like the son of man clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band his head and hair were white like wool as white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write these things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. And the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are what? The angels, the angels of the seven churches. Well, uh, if you've got a uh, reference note for the word angels there, the word angels we know means messengers. So the, the literal translate, if, if you did a literal translation of the word angelos, instead of a transliteration to angels, it would say the seven stars are the messengers of the seven churches, which I think would be a more correct translation there. Uh, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. And, and you know, uh, I, I point to that to uh, make reference to the fact that uh, the first century congregations had uh, kind of a, an, an appointed person that was the messenger for the church. Now that's uh, kind of all packaged up in evangelist, preacher, teacher, you know, all that. But in the first century church, there was a specific role of what we would probably refer to as the, the reader, right? So that when the church received a letter, as the, the New Testament was being written, that's, that's the way it was being written. We see it referred to there in Revelation, and we see it in Colossians and in other places where when one congregation received a letter, 
they made a copy of it, and they sent it on to the next congregation. And so the congregation, first century churches were receiving uh, uh, these letters. And when they would receive the letters, there was the, the messenger of the church, we might say, or the angel of the church that would read that letter to the church, right? Um, in, in the synagogue system, which the synagogue system, the, the worship of the church is not modeled after the temple service, <laughs> uh, the Old Testament temple service. Uh, and I know a lot of denominations try to model their worship with the altar and all, you know, all, all these things, the robes and all this. They try to model that after the Old Testament temple worship. But, but the, the New Testament church is modeled after the synagogue, right? Because uh, where were the synagogues? The, the, the temple was in a set location, right, uh, in Jerusalem. Well, where is the temple of God today? The altar, we might say, the place where the altar is. Where is that? It's in heaven, right? Uh, and, and so uh, where were the synagogues? Wherever there were Jews. Right? Wherever there were Jews, they would assemble in a synagogue. Right? So, kind of the same thing in the New Testament church. Uh, we uh, direct our worship to heaven. We, we direct our prayers to heaven where God, where the head of the church is at the right hand of God, where the presence of God is. The altar is, you know, heaven. And uh, in the Old Testament system, they face Jerusalem. Right? So, the church, the worship of the church in the New Testament, when we read about the, the worship of the church, it's uh, identical to the way they worshiped in the synagogues, right? They uh, had teaching from the scriptures. They prayed. They uh, gave um, for the uh, synagogue, for the, for the work of the synagogue, for, for, for benevolence. You know, they, they had a collection for those things. Um, they, they sang hymns, and <laughs> they didn't use instruments in the synagogues either. The only place where there were instruments were in the temple. So the synagogues didn't have instruments. They, when they sang, it was a cappella in the synagogues. Uh, the only thing we do in the New Testament church that they didn't do in the synagogue, obviously, is the Lord's Supper in remembrance of the, the sacrifice of Christ. So... Uh, and we're going to see that. When we go through Acts chapter 13, we're going to see an example of it, uh, explicit, an explicit example of it, where um, they had the, the, the custom of when somebody came to the synagogue, a visiting um, scholar, we might say, or they, they would say rabbi or teacher, uh, when, when somebody visited the synagogue from somewhere else, they would... Uh, Ask that person, did, did, did they want to deliver a message? Right? So, so you had the, the messengers of the, the uh, churches. Um, and, and it may be that's what James was, that, that he was the designated messenger to the church in Jerusalem, right? Um, with the elders and, and the deacons and the, the brethren, that, that James is singled out and, and is. Uh, named that, you know, you, you, you kind of see him as a prominent figure of the Jerusalem church because he was in a public role in the church as the evangelist or messenger or, you know, however you want to see that. So we might say that James was the angel of the church in Jerusalem. Um, any questions, comments? Um, yeah. It's yeah, angelos. Yeah, it's the same Greek word, angelos. Now you know, there's it, it'll uh, have a different form based on the you know tense and you know the um, it, it, it's it won't have a different gender because. It's a it's a gendered word, but um, 
it, it, it the, 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 we might say root word, I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it or not, but uh, would be angelos, which is transliterated to angel. But the literal meaning of the word is messenger. Now, we see, uh, we see divine beings referred to as angels, and it is a name of a divine being because of their, uh, or, or a spiritual being, I should say. It is the, the designation of a spiritual being because they were used as messengers, right? So they're referred to as angels. But the word itself means messenger. That's what it means. And, and you do see the word applied other than to spiritual beings, uh, where people, like, for example, Paul is referred to as an angel, as a messenger. And in, in, in that context, it is translated messenger. I think it should be translated that way in, in Revelation chapter 1, too, uh, or where it refers to the angel of the church. I think it would be better to refer to it, to translate it as messenger, because it's obviously in the context of a person there, not a spiritual being, <laughs> right? So. Right. Right. You know, uh, you know something that that you never see in the Bible. You ever seen that that meme where there's uh, like a uh, usually a wizened old man, sometimes a skeleton, where he's leaning over a book like searching for something, and the meme will say something like, you know, still looking for the sinner's prayer in the Bible, or still, you know, uh, so, something like that, where you know you're looking for something that's obviously not there. Well, you know, one of the things that you never find in the Bible. Is a female angel. It's not there, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, we we well, you know, Jesus said in the resurrection we are like angels, uh, in the sense that you know we're we're purely spiritual beings that don't have any physical needs anymore and. He's referring to marriage there. Is uh, in the resurrection, um, there's not going to be the necessity for marrying or giving in marriage for you know, off producing offspring or or you know uh, uh, satisfying physical needs. Uh, that that's not there in, in in the spiritual realm. And so that that's the point is that we're like angels of heaven in that sense. But he doesn't say we become angels, right? Any other questions or comments? So, uh, 395, Peter sent, he wanted the, the, the report of his being released from prison sent to James and the brethren. Uh, 396, what happened the next morning? Yeah. Then, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir, which... Uh, what does that say about when Peter went to Mary's house and found them praying? When it says that they were praying. When was that? They were praying through the night. Fasting and praying through the night. Right? But then they doubt that <laughs> Peter has been set free. You know, it, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting lesson there for sure. So it says... Uh, uh, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So um, what happened the next morning? Peter, Peter was... they. they Realized that Peter was gone, and that 
that was uh, one of the things that that shows in addition to the context of when Peter was arrested um, the guards that were charged for guarding Peter if uh, they were considered guilty of uh, letting Peter escape the same punishment that was intended for Peter would be done to them which means that what was the punishment intended for Peter death, death right because the soldiers got executed in his place for letting him escape according to according to their perception for letting him escape um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say it was the, the, the quadrennian that, that were charged with keeping him. Yeah, those 16 that were charged with keeping him. Because, um, you know, they were, he was put in their charge, the, the, those 16 soldiers. So, I mean, that, that would be my speculation. It would just be speculation is, you know, was it just the ones that were on duty? Well, I know it was at least those, uh, but um, yeah. knowing the setting and 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 Herod, uh, I would yeah. I mean, remember the family that this guy's from, right? He, his his uh, uh, uncle had John the Baptist beheaded because his stepdaughter pleased him with a sensuous dance. You know, not good people, right? Uh, his his uh, uh, grandfather had all the children in a village killed to try to kill opposition to himself, uh, which is which is why this Herod was raised in Rome, because his grandfather killed his father, viewing him as a challenge to his own authority. Right? Not good people. I, I don't have any doubt that that Herod, um, if if he was enraged at Peter's being uh, allowed to escape, which undoubtedly he was, he, he would have wanted at least the 16 killed, if not more. <clears throat> kind of ruthless people, the, the whole bunch. And so it says, and he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So the next question, where did Herod go? He went to Caesarea. What conflict is addressed? Uh, now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace, because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. <laughs> so there was um, a conflict between Herod and the people of Tyre and Sidon that they were that they were trying to resolve. And and they uh, made a connection, a high-powered connection, to try to get them peace with the king. And uh, they were uh, running down that connection, we might say. Uh, number 400, or uh, number 399, how did Herod address the people of Tyre and Sidon? <clears throat> so on a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel. Josephus records this event and uh, says that the garment that Herod wore was threaded with silver. And so as he stood on the balcony in the sun, he uh, shone uh, his, his uh, silver-stitched garment shone very, very brightly. And, and that's what it's talking about here. And Josephus describes, it in some de describes his death in some detail too, which is pretty gruesome. Um, so it says uh, arrayed in royal apparel sat on his throne and gave an oration to them and the people kept shouting the voice of a God and not of a man then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died and like I said Josephus describes that and uh, the 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 ailment that Herod died of and the manner of his death and it's pretty graphic and pretty gruesome. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, yeah, well, I mean, it was it was a period of time. At this time, he came down with uh, 
severe abdominal pain, we might say, severe intestinal cramps, and and you know Josephus describes how it went, and you know his yeah his you know entrails coming out and everything, and it, it's gruesome. Uh, <coughs> Spiritual being, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, so, uh, verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. So, uh, um, how did the people respond? They shouted out to Herod, the voice of a God, not of a man. Uh, what happened to Herod and why? He was stricken by an angel of the Lord and died a gruesome death, and why? Because he did not give glory to God. We're going to talk more about that in the evening lesson. Uh, verse four or, or number four hundred two. How is the growth of the church described? The word of God grew and multiplied. So what happens when the word of God grows and multiplies? People are saved, right? People are saved. <clears throat> and then that last verse kind of uh, goes with chapter 13. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So Mark is introduced in verse 12. And then it says that Barnabas and Saul took Mark with them. So it doesn't say explicitly, but where might have... Barnabas and Saul have been during the events of Peter's arrest and release and where did Peter go? Mary's house, the, the mother of John Mark. And then here, Barnabas and Saul return from Jerusalem. As they go from Jerusalem back to Antioch. And who goes with them? John Mark whose mother's house is where everybody was when Peter got a... So might it be that Barnabas and Saul were there when Peter came? And uh, now, as they're leaving, they, they're, they, they take John Mark with them to go back to the work in, in Antioch. Um, well, uh, we, we know that John Mark went with them because it says. But it's, it's interesting that John Mark is introduced in verse 12, uh, in the context of it being his mother's house where Peter went when he got out of prison and then at the end of chapter 12 he goes with Barnabas and Saul okay well where were Barnabas and Saul I don't think it's a far fetched speculation to say that they were at Mary's house with the brethren right any other questions comments alright we'll start chapter 13 Wednesday night <coughs>
Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you. Just a couple of things before we begin this morning. I have an update on Joanne. She's home from the hospital, and she's taking uh, several medications for her AFib. And also, she's on oxygen and has one of these tanks. Now, I don't know how big the tank is, but she said it's too big for her to handle. So she has to go in the way. She has to get somebody to take the tank uh, with her. But she is going tomorrow, hopefully she, to the doctor, to get a prescription for a portable tank. And I know that'll be good. Also, you need to refer to the bulletin for information about others who are sick, have an interest in our prayers. Also in the bulletin, there are a couple of things about our gospel meeting. It begins on May 5th. Uh, so look at that uh, the, and, and be praying for that gospel meeting that Many people will come and uh, be persuaded to become a Christian. Would you bow with me now for a short prayer? Father, we thank you for another beautiful Lord's Day that we're enjoying. For all the blessings you bestow upon us, we're so grateful for them. We're especially grateful for the gift of Christ, the blood that he shed on the cross, that we might have the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for another opportunity to assemble to worship you, and we pray that everything we say, everything we do in our worship will be in harmony with your will, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your great and wonderful name. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for springtime as we see the leaves beginning to turn green once again. The trees are filling and the birds, we can hear them singing all around us. And we know that when you set this world up in the very beginning that you had a plan and you made it for us. And we thank you for all the wonderful things that you give us each and every day. Father, as our service has begun, we ask that what we do today in worshiping you would please you. We ask that you would forgive us of our sins at this time, for we often fall short on the things that we need to do and sometimes step over the line, and we need your forgiveness, and we're so grateful and thankful that your blood cleanses us uh, daily of those sins whenever we uh, confess to you and let you know that we repent. Father, we just thank you uh, for this congregation. We ask that you will help it uh, continue to grow. Father, we ask that you would help us as well with the uh, upcoming gospel meeting in a few weeks that it will be a very successful gospel meeting. That we'll be able to bring uh, friends, be able to bring neighbors, to be able to bring those that are lost in the world, those that are confused, and those that have a, a heart that's seeking you. But we would ask that you would bless our upcoming speaker as he prepares to come and uh, prepares to deliver those messages. Father, we ask too that you would be with our own uh, people here, be with Norm as he brings our lesson this morning, continue to be with Dan as he leads us in song, and to help us all to sing out to you the, the praises that you deserve even more so. Father, we just thank you for uh, each one that is here today. We ask that you would bless each one for being here. Father, we do have those that are on our sick list and some that we know of that needs our prayers. We ask that you be with Sister Joanne and um, help this medication relieve her problem, and to be able to get that uh, oxygen tank where she'll be able to be back here very, very soon. We ask that you continue to be with Walter uh, as these stents are, this stent's got to be put in or was put in. I'm not quite sure exactly what's happening yet, but I ask that you be with him and the doctors that's going to be taking care of this and for him to be able to uh, once again be back serving the congregation he's at now. Father, guide us in what we do. Always help us to be that shining light, that example in the community that shows that we're one of your children and that they should, that those that see us instead of ridiculing uh, or trying to shame us because we believe something they don't believe, we I would ask that you would help them to understand your word and to know what it truly means for we know that it's only through Christ that we can find salvation Father we ask that you be with those that are uh, governmental leaders we see so many things that's going wrong and the corruption that's in the world today we would ask that you would protect those uh, of the church wherever they are and to be able to withstand whatever comes their way, to be able to continue to spread your word throughout uh, this land and, and the world over. Father, we just ask that you be with each of us today as uh, we strive to live the life that we have dedicated to you. For we ask this prayer through Jesus' holy name. Amen.
This morning I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 12, 12, and 25. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. We pointed out in the Bible class as we were uh, finishing up Acts chapter 12 is that we're uh, introduced to John Mark in verse 12 and then at the end of chapter 12 in verse 25 it says that Barnabas and Saul when they returned to Antioch uh, after delivering the uh, collection that was taken up in Antioch for the uh, brethren in Jerusalem that were suffering a famine 
that they took John Mark back with them. We'll see in chapter 13 as uh, Barnabas and Saul go out on the first missionary journey from Antioch that uh, John Mark goes with them as their uh, assistant, it says. And uh, we do character studies on uh, prominent figures in the New Testament frequently and, and, and see what lessons we can glean from these uh, prominent characters, but we don't talk much about John Mark uh, other than the fact that He's the writer of the gospel according to Mark. Uh, but I would say we probably don't know much more about him than that he wrote the gospel according to Mark. So we want to, to look at some of the uh, facts that are recorded for us in the gospel about this person that we're introduced to in Acts chapter 12 and verse 12 uh, as John Mark. Well, as we've already pointed out, there in Acts chapter 12 and verse 12, where we just heard read, he is uh, the son of Mary. And also over in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10, the apostle Paul makes uh, reference to uh, John Mark, or uh, there, um, saying... In Acts chapter, or Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10, rather, he says, uh, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. That's uh, uh, important to keep that in mind because uh, we're going to see something happen between Paul and, and Mark that makes this more significant, I think. But... Uh, Paul refers to him there, uh, Mark, as the uh, cousin of Barnabas. We uh, know Barnabas uh, introduced in Acts chapter 4 as uh, a benevolent person that sold a piece of property and uh, gave the proceeds uh, for the work of the Jerusalem church, named uh, Levi and uh, given the name Barnabas by the apostles, which means son of encouragement. Well, the, the house that Peter goes to after being released from prison in Acts chapter 12 is the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, who Paul says is the cousin of Barnabas. And so uh, this family of, of Barnabas, we, we don't read about their conversion we don't read about Mark's conversion. We don't read about Barnabas's conversion. We don't read about Mary's conversion. But what we read about the members of this family uh, are uh, is very interesting concerning their dedication to the early church. As we've already pointed out, Barnabas and, and his work, and now uh, he, he's uh, the one who... Uh, steps up for Saul when the disciples in Jerusalem are, are afraid to receive him and Barnabas steps up for Saul and encourages them to receive Saul and then uh, uh, goes and, and uh, gets Saul from Tarsus when, when uh, the gospel begins to spread to the Gentiles uh, and, and uh, is, is there with him in Antioch and now is, is traveling with Paul and working with, with uh, uh, Paul uh, up to this point who we know as uh, Saul of Tarsus. It's in Acts chapter 13 that his name is changed to Paul. But w we see this prominent figure, Barnabas, but also uh, apparently his aunt Mary uh, giving her house for the use of the church. As we read there, that that's where the brethren were assembled together. As we were talking about that last week in the Bible class, or Wednesday night rather, in the Bible class. We, we pointed out that when Peter got out of prison, when the angel uh, led Peter out of prison, and Peter comes to himself and he realizes that it wasn't uh, just a dream, that he had actually been set free from prison miraculously by an angel, he goes to the house of Mary. And, and it seems that, that Peter knows that that's where he can expect to find brethren assembled together. 
at the house of Mary. So, so we've got Barnabas, nicknamed the son of encouragement by the apostles. We've got Mary with, with her, her house being uh, uh, given to the use of the church, where Peter knows that that's where the church is going to be assembled together, and he can, he can go and he can find brethren assembled there. And then her son, John Mark, being a writer of one of the four Gospels, a traveling companion of Barnabas and Saul, and one who is mentioned frequently uh, by Paul in his writing. Uh, certainly a prominent family in the, in the early church. And, and uh, someone who has good lessons to be to be gleaned from his character and his life. Well, as we've mentioned, he was an early traveling companion of Paul and Barnabas. It says there in uh, verse 25 of Acts chapter 12, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So uh, where the class ended uh, this morning... Uh, I presented the speculation about where Barnabas and Saul might have been when Peter went to the house of Mary. Because it says in verse 12 that Peter went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname is Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And then in verse 25 it says that Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem taking Mark with them. So Mark, who's introduced at the house that Peter goes to, then goes with Barnabas and Saul when they go back to Antioch. So where might Barnabas and Saul have been <laughs> when Peter went to the house of Mary? I, I don't think it's a far-fetched speculation. It has, to, it has to be a speculation because the, the text doesn't explicitly uh, state uh, that they were there. But I think it's pretty strongly implied, at the very least, that that's where they were. That's where the brethren were uh, 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 assembled, and that's where they were. And so they take John Mark with them when they go back to Antioch. And then uh, when they go out on their first missionary journey, John Mark goes with them as an assistant. Uh, notice in Acts chapter 13 and verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. So he was traveling with them, assisting them in their work on this first missionary journey. However, uh, we see also in verse 13 of chapter 13 that when Paul and his party set sail, and you'll notice there that now Saul has been changed to Paul, and from, from uh, Acts chapter 13 on, he's referred to as Paul. And we'll, we'll see that when we get into Acts chapter 13. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga, in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So he goes back to Jerusalem where he left with them uh, in chapter 12. Here it says he went back to Jerusalem. And <clears throat> when we get to the second missionary journey of Paul, there is a contention between Paul and Barnabas over... Mark going with them. Notice in Acts chapter 15 and verse 36 begin, where uh, in making preparations to go out on another missionary journey, it says, Then after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. 
And maybe because he was his cousin. Maybe because he thought he was particularly useful in the work. Uh, we don't know. But what we do know is that Barnabas was determined that Mark was going to go with him to the work. But it says, but Paul insisted. So <laughs> we need to make note of uh, those two words in particular. Barnabas was determined, and Paul was insistent. So uh, when there are two people or two parties that uh, are determined on one hand and insistent on the other hand, then it's not very likely there's going to be a compromise between those two parties. So it says, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone to them, not gone with them to the work. So uh, we're not told why Mark departed, uh, but it was obviously for a reason that Paul did not feel to be a justified reason. And it may be that, that they were headed into a treacherous area. When, when Paul wrote to the Philippians and, and uh, uh, made reference to being in threat of robbers or robberies, uh, he's likely referring to these uh, Pamphylian highlands that he was headed into, which were well known to be uh, dangerous. And, and an area where it was pretty likely. You know, we, we, we know those areas where uh, we, we tell people, now, you, you don't want to go over there, especially after dark. Don't, don't go over that part of town. Well, that's kind of how the Pamphylian Highlands were, right? It was known that traveling through there, you better have some guards because there are robbers in that area. They're, they're, that they will get you, right? And so it may be that, that Mark... Uh, uh, said, you know, I'm not, I'm not going through there. I'm going home. And so Paul didn't appreciate that, that he had left him. Or it may be that, that Mark, just being a young man, first time away from Jerusalem, first time away from home, was homesick and wanted to go home. And so he, he did. But whatever it was, whatever his reason for leaving, Paul didn't think it was a justified reason. Uh, and so he did not want to take Mark with them on this uh, second journey. And the contention was, was so great, it says, that Paul and Barnabas parted ways. It says, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not, had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commanded, uh, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So we, we can <clears throat> see uh, somewhat of a positive outcome here of this contention between Paul and Barnabas because they part way and so now instead of one team of missionaries uh, there's two teams of missionaries covering more territory and so a positive outcome to a you know negative event uh, certainly but uh, Mark being the source of this contention uh, is interesting especially when we see that later Paul recognized Mark as useful for ministry. So, so here, uh, uh, Paul was so insistent that, that Mark not go with them because he had left them before and he had gone back to Jerusalem. Whatever the reason was, Paul didn't think it was a justified reason and he didn't want to take Mark with him again because he had left him before. And, and was so insistent that they not take Mark that he parted ways with Barnabas. And yet, years later, recognizes Mark as being useful 
for ministry. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, where uh, Paul makes reference uh, to Mark. He says, beginning in verse 9, uh, he says to Timothy, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me. So talking about someone that had left him. <laughs> uh, the same contention he had with Barnabas over not taking Mark because Mark had left them in the work. Well, here he refers to Demas has forsaken me. It's certainly that's a, there's a stronger implication of uh, falling away from the faith there than, than uh, uh, Mark just deciding he wanted to go back home. But he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. So Paul wanted Timothy to go and get Mark and bring Mark to him because he was useful to him for ministry, for service. Same thing it says that, that he assisted Paul and Barnabas. He was an assistant to them. Uh, Paul wants him to come because he is useful for ministry. And so he says, um, again, he is useful to me for ministry. We see over in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10, Paul making reference to uh, Mark there in a uh, uh, positive way, not as the one who had forsaken him or who had left him uh, uh, in the work, had departed from the work, but uh, as someone who was a fellow worker. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. So here he's uh, referring to Mark, uh, not as the one who departed from the work, that, that, he wasn't, that he was so insistent not go with him that he parted ways from Barnabas, but as one who is to be welcomed. If he comes to you, welcome him. He's a, a, a fellow worker in the cause of Christ. Uh, and then in Philemon, written at the same time as uh, uh, Colossians, and uh, to the same audience, Philemon uh, was a, a, a Colossian. The uh, common belief is that the church in Colossae met is the church that's referred to in Philemon as meeting in Philemon's house. And he says there in Philemon 23, uh, and going to, to uh, verse 24, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark. So, uh, as Paul is writing from Rome, in Roman imprisonment, he sends greeting from Mark. So it appears that, that Mark uh, was there with him. As do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. So there he refers to Mark as a fellow laborer. So uh, previously this one that, that, that he was totally unwilling to have go with him to the work, now he recognizes uh, as a fellow laborer, as one that was there with Paul, ministering to Paul while he was in prison as one that he would refer to later as being useful for, for ministry. And I think that there's a, a, an important lesson there uh, that everybody isn't suited for the same work. You know, I, I have uh, uh, known people that, that were remarkable missionaries, like Paul was a remarkable missionary and, and, and could go into foreign places and, and could adapt to those places and could, could relate to the people there very easily and do a great work there. While at the same time I've known other people that were 
uh, great gospel preachers, great Bible teachers that were uncomfortable outside their own backyard but were able to do great work in their own area. So everyone's not suited for the same things. Some of us are, are, are uh, 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 suited for public speaking and teaching. Some of us aren't. Some of us are suited for uh, 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 benevolence, and some of us aren't. That's how we're introduced to Barnabas, Mark's cousin, introduced to Barnabas as one who was uh, uh, especially recognized for his benevolence. Well, some are uh, uh, better suited at benevolent work than others. Some are better suited at visiting than others. And uh, whatever our abilities are, that's what we're supposed to use for the cause of Christ. That's what we're supposed to do for God's glory. We're going to talk more about that this evening, about... Uh, uh, being sure we use our abilities in the right way, with the right spirit, as we look at Herod's example, or an ignored example of Herod this evening. But it's important that we recognize our ability. It may be that, that Mark uh, had, had gone far enough along with them in their missionary journey that, that he recognized, this isn't for me. This... Whatever my service is for Christ, this ain't it. <laughs> I'm going back to Jerusalem. Well, Paul didn't like it, but we're not all suited to the same work. And, and, and sometimes we have to be careful. Like Paul uh, uh, needed to learn. And that's one of the things that, that we, we see in the book of Acts is that what the apostles preached, what they taught, what they wrote was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Their conduct was not. And sometimes their, their, their conduct provides a negative example as much as a positive example. Because here, uh, uh, Paul seems to uh, uh, not recognize that Mark had useful service to render. It just wasn't on the missionary trail. And so he and Barnabas parted ways. We have to recognize what our service is and render that service to God's glory, to serve God in such a way that he's glorified, whatever that service might be. I think that's a that, that's an example we, we learned from Mark here. As uh, Mark returned back to Jerusalem and yet is recognized as one who is useful for ministry. And as we look on at Mark, it may be that Mark was Peter's Timothy. Right? We, 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 we see Paul refer to Timothy. If you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse uh, 14 beginning, uh, where uh, Paul makes reference to Timothy there, and how he makes reference to Timothy, it says, uh, beginning in verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 14, he says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children I warn you, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, Yet you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. That, that means that whatever a person says that they did to be born again, it has to be uh, uh, verified in the gospel. You have to be able to find it in the gospel. Not like the sinner's prayer or uh, the, the direct operation of the Holy Spirit or other things that people say that they, they did to be saved. Because we don't find that anywhere in the gospel. Paul says that he uh, uh, brought about the new birth of those in Corinth by the gospel. I have begotten you through the gospel. Now look what he says about Timothy. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere 
in every church. So he, he refers to Timothy there as his son in the faith. Look at how Peter refers to Mark in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13, where uh, Peter, bringing his uh, epistle to a close, says there, beginning in verse 12, By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying, that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. Uh, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a, a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So he makes this reference to Mark, my son. Now it may be that, because we know Peter was married, that's one of the things that, uh, uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Uh, he said, do I, have not, do, I, do I not have the right to carry about a believing wife as do Cephas and the other apostles? Uh, so we know that, that Peter was married. Maybe this is his actual son in the flesh uh, who was named Mark. Uh, but it, it seems much more likely and uh, seems to be the consensus of uh, most commentators that this is a reference to John Mark that we've read uh, about in, in all these passages we've been looking at. Uh, that this is a reference to John Mark and he's referring to John Mark as his son in the same way that Paul refers to Timothy as his son. Remember where Peter went when he realized that the angel had delivered him from prison. He went to Mary's house where the brethren were assembled, Mary, the mother of John Mark. Uh, this may refer to uh, Mark, maybe his family. We, again, we don't read about the conversion of Barnabas or about Mark or uh, that, that family. We don't, we don't read about their conversion. We don't know what the circumstances of their conversion were. Other than that, they were converted in Jerusalem. They were a family in Jerusalem. Uh, but it may be that uh, Mark was a convert of, of Peter and, and worked closely with Peter. Uh, some commentators refer to him as a disciple of Peter. And so uh, he seems to be Peter's Timothy, so to speak, close with Peter. So uh, this person... Uh, John Mark that we're introduced to in, in Acts chapter 12 that begins the first missionary journey with, with uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas and then goes back so that Paul then later doesn't want to take him on another missionary journey yet still recognizes that he's useful for ministry provides a good example for us in, in, in uh, uh, being someone who is dedicated to the work of the church and, and in recognizing uh, what the, the sphere of his work was. We, we see his family, a family that was dedicated to the work of the church. He's someone who is useful for ministry, someone who was uh, uh, closely associated with the apostles, and someone who gave us on the uh, account of, of many, the first gospel record, sometimes referred to as the gospel of Peter, as it is uh, speculated that Mark wrote the gospel according to Mark under Peter's guidance. Uh, so certainly someone that we should be familiar with, someone that we should learn from, someone whose example can... Uh, serve as a good example for us to recognize where our sphere of service is in the church and to fill it diligently so that it can be said of us as it was said of him he's useful she's useful for ministry someone who is an asset to the church now, one thing we know for certain about Mark's conversion is that he heard the word of God he believed what it taught about Christ and his kingdom Believing that, he repented of his sins and confessed that he believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God. 
and was baptized into Christ, have his sins washed away by his blood. And coming up from that watery grave of baptism, he was someone who developed himself into being useful for ministry. If you've not been baptized into Christ this morning, then certainly that is the, the number one priority. If having been baptized into Christ, it couldn't be said of you today that you are useful for ministry. The question needs to be asked as to why. What do I need to do to develop my particular abilities, my particular skills for the work of the church, to be useful for ministry? Whatever your need is this morning, pray with him while he sings. Why do you blame your brother? Oh, why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in his sanctified throne. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? What do you hope, dear brother, to gain my further delay? There's no one to save but Jesus. There's no other way but his way. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Do you not feel your brother? His spirit now striving within. So why not accept his salvation and throw off thy burden of sin? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why do you wait, dear brother? The harvest is passing away. Your Savior is longing to bless you. There's danger and death in delay. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Please be seated. We are now turn over to number 299. 299, we're going to sing this song to help prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper. <coughs> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder Yeah. 
the turnover is 572. 572. We'll send the first record to sign, and then we'll be dismissed. We'll go to the prayer. You would stand while we sing the song, please. Thank you. 